Jean-Paul Beberian. So thank you very much. I am negative to COVID and positive here. Good. Um, before I start my talk, I want to say two things. One is I know very well George Egerly, and I know many scientists, but there are some scientists that come out of the lot, you know. And George Egerly is really a great scientist who knows how to think out of the box. And what he has done is amazing because he worked on a shoestring and he's made great discoveries. I think uh, if someone can help him financially to go ahead with that technology, it's great. He deserves it. <laughs> second, second, I want to advertise my, my poster, which is not on, there, actually, but it's online. For those online, they can visit it. And because in this poster, I mentioned uh, these charge clusters, electron clusters, and we can see that easily, and you will see it on the poster. If you go online, you will see it, and maybe on paper one day. Anyway, I will talk to you today about this. I mean, two years ago, <laughs> I, was, I received an email, Frank Gordon, as telling me that he had discovered something and if I was interested in trying to replicate it. So as I, am, as I said, I like to replicate things. Uh, that's been years now, I'm trying to replicate Ponce and Flashman, so uh, <laughs> I can continue replicating. <laughs> so I said yes, and he ex explained me what he did, and I knew I could do the experiment. So um, this is what I've done, I've been doing for two years now. Um, I will show you now what I've done, actually. This is the first design. I took, uh, first design was, I had some palladium aluminum rods, 10 centimeter long, two millimeter in diameter. I put it in a six millimeter stainless steel tube, just like that, and I was hoping to see something which was, well, it was palladium. But nothing was coming out. So I decided to do the other thing, deposit palladium on palladium. So after depositing palladium on palladium, I see something. I could measure a voltage versus the resistance. And at high resistance, obviously, the current is, the voltage is larger. So I could measure almost 350 millivolts. So I was quite happy. I had made a replication. It was faster than the Ponce and Fleischmann one. <laughs> Definitely. Well, less power, but, but faster. <laughs> Then I tried to check, to calculate the power versus the resistance, and I saw a peak. And I know scientists love peaks. I mean, like, they like resonances, so that's a big thing. So there was one. Then I said, well, if we want to increase the current, we have to increase the surface. So I decided to make larger cells. So I, took, I made some stainless steel tubes, deposited palladium on one of them, put them one inside the other in a vacuum chamber, and I could put hydrogen in it. And there there was. The voltage was high, more than 700 millivolts. Amazing. I mean, I'm breaking records after records, you know. <laughs> the Olympics have been number one. <laughs> <laughs> it will be in Paris in two years, so. <laughs> so then I have the power again with a peak. It's not the same place, but another peak anyway, so it's good enough. Now, I oh, it's in French, but you understand French. Uh, the voltage as a function of temperature. And then I was surprised there was an uh, inversion of voltage. Actually, I had to do that in the kitchen oven, you know, so it wasn't very precise in temperature wise. Anyway, there was a change in voltage. Then recently, with a friend of mine, he was at the beginning of the talk anyway, his name Jean-Philippe Ginesté, we made uh, uh, two tubes. The outer tube is copper, and the inner tube is aluminum, actually an aluminum alloy. And uh, I deposited, I mean, when I did it without deposition of any palladium, there was nothing happening. Then we deposited the palladium, I closed it, and I was trying to make sure there was no short. So I took my ohm meter, 
it was infinite in one direction and zero in the other direction. So what's going on? Then I just dismantled it, checked it. There was no short inside. We put it in, remeasured, we dismantled it again. I mean, I, don't know, I mean, I am can be dumb. I don't understand very fast. At one, then I realized there was a voltage being created in air. And by, when measured the voltage, there was voltage without in air, without doing nothing. So I like it. No, no need to have hydrogen. So now I measure the voltage versus resistance. And you see this wonderful, beautiful curve. I mean, like if I go to school and I do a cool curve like that, I get a good grade. I mean, I get sigmoid, you know, <laughs> curve. Well, you see the voltage goes to more than 500 millivolts. Actually, it's, all, it's absolute value. It's negative compared to the counter electrode. And then if I go to the power, OK, now you have three curves here. You have to be careful. The blue one is the first curve. It went to 40 microwatts. Not bad. And uh, when I increase the, the, I increase the resistance, I decrease the resistance. I mean, I start with 10 megohm, and then I go down. Um, and then when I, I, leave it, I leave it to rest a little bit. It needs some rest. This thing breezes, you know? It's like humans. You cannot go, go swimming underneath too long. And after three minutes, you have to go back. So I leave it there. And then second time, it became the orange one, went to 80 milliwatts. I was micro, microwatt, I'm sorry. It was very good. And then after a long time later, it went down to 10 microwatts. That's OK. That's life. I'm learning. But I'm still on the learning curve. So I measure the current versus the resistivity. And you can see it. 400 microamps of current, not bad at all. Now, I looked at the voltage versus time. People are interested to see how long it lasts. So I've done a number of experiments here. And after each run, it's hard to see because I didn't put the numbers. The, the load was 1 kilo ohm. But you see the blue curve at the bottom. The second time, it's a bit higher. Third time, it's higher, then higher and higher. Then I have to tell you a few things. Um, this current, this voltage, is not always stable. Sometimes it is very stable, and sometimes it starts shaking, uh, like earthquakes or something, like current, in, I mean, like cold fusion. You know, sometimes you have bursts of current, you have the same thing here, but negative bursts. It doesn't give much more, it gives less. Now, you can do the same thing with the power versus, versus time. It's almost two days, you know, every time. But after some time, the first experiments were dying very quickly. And then the last one was lasting longer. I, I don't know why I stopped it. I, that's the problem with experiments. You have to stop it at one time. After one day, two days, 10 days, I mean, how long will you leave it there? I usually, I like when I go traveling so I can leave it for a long period of time. But I didn't do that. Now, again, the voltage versus resistor. Now, oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back at this one. I'm sorry. Versus temperature. I'm sorry. I, I don't even know how to read my own reading, writing. I'm like doctors. Um, if you look at the voltage, it goes up and down. It's not the same thing as the other one. Now. I can, I like calculating active exchange energies, you know, because I have the power versus temperature, one over T. So I can calculate the activation energy. So I don't have my glasses on, so you can read better than I do. <laughs> well, well, it's okay, you know. <laughs> it's very chemical type of uh, reaction. Anyway, you have the activation energy. Conclusion. Well, experiments are reproducible. Voltage is, at, at least at room temperature, voltage is negative versus control electrode. I like to go to higher temperatures. I would do that in the, in the future. But you have to make sure that the insulation will not melt with temperature. So I have to do that better. Um, I tried putting it uh, in a variable magnetic field or static magnetic field. No effect at all. I went from 0 hertz to 6 hertz. There was no difference, nothing. Um, 
I've observed that there is an increase of the magnitude by increasing the surface area. That makes sense. I've proved it. Uh, Activation energy, now I can read it, 0.23 <laughs> electron volt. So this is good for theoreticians. They love it. Um, now, a lot more work. I, actually, I love this work because it's much faster to, repeat, to reproduce than the Pons and Flashman one after 33 years. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, I don't know. Now we have, uh, we have two. Look, like a show now. <laughs> We're not going to dance now. Yeah. We're going <laughs> to have a joint question and answer session after I tell people how okay. we're going to scale well, up. Can you imagine two better people to replicate? I mean, talk about body armor for me. I've, someone stand up here and say, I've got something that you screw it together, it'll self-initiate and self-sustain the production of a voltage and current. You would say, I don't know what he's smoking, but I want some of that stuff. So anyhow, it's great to have these kinds of replications. Can you cue up the... Uh, Scaling up the lek. One second, we're having a little technical issue. Now we're good. Okay. All right. So, hopefully by now, you will agree that the lek will spontaneously self-initiate and self-sustain the production of a voltage and current through an electrical load, and that's an important part. It's repeatable, independent replications, peer-reviewed publications, naturally radioactive materials aren't involved. So the question is, is it scalable? We need to scale up by six to 10 orders of magnitude to produce it, go from a few microwatts to a few watts or kilowatts. Direct energy conversion devices have a big challenge. Uh, for example, it, an amp requires 6.24 times 10 to the 18th charge carriers per second. A Curie is 3.7 times 10 to the 10th uh, Becquerel. So a commercial battery or a nuclear batteries have been patented for a long time, but they've never really been produced because it takes a lot of curies to produce an amp of current. And, and for example, there's a commercial battery in development now by a company where they use 100 curies of tritium to produce 100 milliwatts of power. So if they wanted to scale that up to 10 watts, it would require 10,000 curies of radiation. We do use some nuclear batteries for space where we don't have other options. And I should have asked Larry or the NASA people how many kilograms of plutonium, I think that's what they use, is launched. Uh, it's not a good thing. We hope we never have to splatter one of those in the ocean. So the challenge is can we scale the LEC up from a few watts to a few kilowatts and require six to 10 orders of magnitude? The advantage we have is that we can do this, since we don't require nuclear radiation, we have multiple opportunities for scale up. I've identified five focus areas to scale up. First is improved metallurgy. We need to increase the production of the ionizing radiation, also make it last longer. Second is optimize the gas composition and density, the initial pressure improve the designs to improve, increase ion harvesting, uh, elevate the temperatures, as we've seen in, from what John Paul showed, and also increase the surface area, another thing that, that John Paul showed. Supporting analysis for this, we need to identify the source and the type of ionizing radiation emitted from the working electrode. That's a challenge. Identify the role that the counter electrode may play in ionizing the gas. We, we have some hypotheses, but we don't know. Identify the gas mixtures that optimize the production of ions, and I'll say more about each of these, and analyze the gas ion physics in the cell. It ends up, this ends up being a fourth order nonlinear differential equation with a lot of parameters. And if you're gonna try and solve that with just empirically with, with experiments, you're gonna be around a while trying to do that. Okay, let's go back and, and kind of look through some of the experiments that we've taken and why I think where we have opportunities to scale up. On the left, you recognize the lab rat without the americiums this time. And on, on the right, you see a plot of current versus time. This was a cell that we were, had, were running and, and you know, 
it ran, this, the total test error is about 14 and a half days, a little over two weeks. And you can see it, A, D, E, the, the cell jumped up. The, these are, the data here is at the average of a file, and a file is about a minute long. So we were sampling 512 t times a second and average that, and that's what you see as, as a point there. At B, we did one of the load tests that, that we did, that you've seen, you know, where we apply a, a, current, a resistance box. At F, you know, we realized that at, we were actually conducting current at the maximum that the current limiting resistor would allow at, along, at A, D, and E. So I talked to Harper and I said, can we change the current limiting resistor? So we cut it in half. We also had to change the resistor to the instrumentation because it had a limit of plus or minus 10 volts. And when we did that, it jumped up to F. And it was going along there and it was stayed up there for a couple of days. Well, if a little is good, more is better, right? So we tried that again. We cut it in half again. And, and Harper was watching the screen when I, when I flipped the switch. It went up for a few milliseconds and then dropped and at G and, and never really recovered. We believe that you know, we either had a spark or we burned out some active sites or whatever. There are a couple of things that we can learn from this. Uh, one is it would be awfully strange if all of these, if the whole uniform surface turned on and turned off at the same time as you see here. We suspect that, that, the, that the electrode is not uniformly producing the ionizing radiation. It may be coming from a few localized spots. And we've seen other experiments that indicate that. Uh, the second is that notice that in this, when we have a potential across, we are actually sweeping out the ions about every one millisecond. And then here we were sampling at 512, so we're, our sample is about two milliseconds wide. So, so we are sampling a new set of ions with each point here. And we're getting 1.2 uh, milliamps and actually uh, probably had more than that. So we believe that better metallurgy will allow us to increase the number of active sites by one to two orders of magnitude and cell designs to improve harvesting, we may get, be able to get two orders of magnitude by doing that because typically we think the LEC is actually, because of the voltages, the LEC is only harvesting about 0.1, about a tenth of a percent of the number of ions actually being produced. So if we could increase that to 10 percent, that, that is two orders of magnitude. Another thing that we've talked about is temperature. On the left, you see a plot. The orange line is the increase in temperature from room temperature, which is about 25 degrees, up to 185 degrees. The blue line is the open circuit voltage, which went up almost five orders of magnitude, starting at about 0 0.01 uh, millivolts up to over 500 millivolts. We did three load tests during this. The first one was done at 80 degrees C. At that point, we had enough voltage that we could actually conduct a load test. We did another load test at 145 and one at the maximum temperature of 185. And you can see the power, which is plotted there on, on the right. Uh, we believe that we can use temperature to increase maybe three to four orders of magnitude increase in power. This was another test we did. Actually, this was the cold test that I showed in the first slide where, where we saw that it go down and convince us that, that we were producing a voltage and current even when we had zero voltage. But I put it here because you can see as we reduce the voltage, the current comes down. Uh, and you see that on the left. On the right, we plot the current versus voltage going up and down. The thing that's interesting here is the work of J.J. Thompson where he had a constant uh, radiation source, a constant number of ions being produced. His, his curve would go, as he applied more potential, would go up and saturate. So it, it would go up like this and saturate. Here what you see is it is going the other way. 
suggesting that we're actually increasing the number of ions that are being produced as the voltage goes up. In fact, when we do a more detailed analysis of that, we see that, that the, the voltage is actually going up cubic compared, uh, current's going up cubic compared to the voltage. So there may be redesigns of the cell that we could use that would increase the, the output of ions. Of course, the obvious thing is increasing the area of the working electrode. And John Paul showed his work. We have been focusing on, on designing and using flat electrodes because you know, it's obviously very easy to use a flat electrode. I can put a counter electrode on top. I have a much better control of the spacing between the two. And it turns out that your, your whole electrode cell is only uh, you know, two or three millimeters thick. So you could see how we could stack groups of those and getting to one meter, you know, we've done a lot of our analysis based on a per square centimeter normally. So if, if we increase that to one meter, that's 10 to the fourth. Uh, uh, 10 square meters is 10 to the fifth. So, so this is another area that we think is we can use for scaling up. So if you take the five areas that I've identified, uh, one to two orders of magnitude from, from better metallurgy. And by the way, Ed Storms thinks that that's low. He wants us to try his, some of his uh, part, particulate material, and we're going to do that. Optimize gas composition. We believe one order of magnitude there. Im improve the designs to increase the harvesting. We're saying one to two orders of magnitude, like if I can go from a tenth of a percent to 10%, that's two orders of magnitude. Uh, modest increase in temperature, 185 degrees C is not all that hot. Uh, so you can see three to four orders of magnitude and increased electrode surface area, four to five. If you add those up, it comes to somewhere between 10 and 14 orders of magnitude. Now, admittedly, these are not all independent variables. But so, so we may be double counting some things, but I think there's still a lot of reason for optimism. So tempering the optimism, you know, these results are encouraging, but one of the things that we've observed is that, and John Paul showed this, is that the, the lec tends to deg degradate over time. However, the, we have one cell that we've have, has been operating for over eight years that we've been putting, where we've been applying a potential and the degradation is not showing up as much there. So, so we, we want to try something right now with the, the working electrode is higher work function than the counter electrode. We're gonna reverse that and, and do some tests with a, with a counter electrode of carbon, which is very high so that, so that it will be higher than the working electrode. That hopefully will then drive the hydrogen back in to the working electrode and help maintain the, the power. Another thing, we don't know how the gas is being ionized. Uh, it's coming from somewhere. And so if we had a, uh, had a way to understand that, that would help. We, we don't have definitive proof that Leonard is involved. <clears throat> we had an arrangement, <clears throat> excuse me, with San Diego State to analyze the gas from experiments. They did one test that we kind of took down as a checkout and COVID hit and we haven't been able to get back. And I contacted the professor a couple of months ago and he said their, their equipment is still, has not been recalibrated and, and he's, he's slammed just trying to keep his graduate students on schedule so they graduate. So, so that's something we could do. Uh, the LEC is simple in construction and you've seen that, but extremely complex to, to analyze. And so, you know, more analysis is necessary and Scaling up the five target areas is, like I said, most likely not a linear process as some, some of the targets may not be achieved. So in conclusion, while we may not achieve, achieve the 10 to 14 orders of magnitude, we believe that we can scale the lack up to the point where it will be a viable energy, green energy source. Uh, I want to mention at this point that other people have replicated and Fabrice David is one and he's got a poster here. So I encourage you to stop by and talk to his poster. Also my coworker Harper Whitehouse has put a poster, has a poster on his analysis and 
and he would enjoy talking to you on that and answering your questions. So with that, uh, I'd like to have a question, open it up for a question and answer. I know you're using palladium, but did you say that you can do this with iron? Actually, yes, we did that. And, and we know in this community that nickel works. Uh, I suspect that a lot of metal nickel or metal hydrides might be candidates. And, and that's very, you know, very important from a cost standpoint, from an availability standpoint. And, and so, Yes, that's one of the things that's very encouraging. Hi, Frank. Uh, Nicolas Chauvin. Um, during uh, co-deposition, uh, apparently the electroplating, you're applying uh, tens of kilojoules, and then the cell is able to produce uh, tens of joules. Uh, is there any chance that uh, some energy is stored during the codeposition process in some electrochemical form? Yes, I believe, I, in fact, I believe that there is some energy stored that way. Uh, that tells us, that's another clue of maybe how we can scale up because that's a flux issue. So if there are ways we can design cells where we maybe have pressure on one side of, of the membrane and, and flux through the membrane. And the other thing, you know, we need co-deposition. Co-deposition, as Foucault says, will automatically produce vacancies. And so whether it's vacancies or cracks or whatever, as Antonio showed, uh, just you needed co-deposition. So, so I suspect that, that some of the energy we're seeing is energy that's been stored up, but that still doesn't explain how is it ionizing the gas you know, there, there are a lot of things that are occurring that are not expected. Well, uh, indeed, uh, the deposition conditions seems to be very important. I also replicated exactly the same experiment with ion codeposition, and it, I confirm it works, at least for a few days. But if you do the codeposition in some cases, you get a peeling of your ion, you know, so you have to be very careful with the co-deposition and on its own, there is a lot of work to do on this. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, you know, this is why better metallurgy, that was number one on my list. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, Ed has said he would like to test some of his, his, chem, his particulate uh, working electrodes in my cell. I would offer anyone who has, you've got your favorite electrode, uh, have you ever checked to see if it's producing ionizing radiation? Okay. Well, excuse me, have you tried? There's lots of new forms of carbon, as graphene and other uh, more amazing, uh, very high conductivity materials like, uh, of carbon. Has any carbon uh, electrode been used in this project? No. No, we haven't at this point. We, like I said, we want to try a carbon counter electrode because uh, of the high work function, and that would reverse the current flow into the working electrode, which we think might help keep it loaded. Hi, Frank. Very yeah. nice. Um, it strikes me that if you're trying to measure uh, radiation outside of that outer tube, that's going to uh, stop almost everything. You need to be on the inside of the tube. Have you done that? Uh, no, but Bark did. In the early 1990s, uh, Sereni Vossen, Rout, and then the group at Mark published several papers that are available in uh, JCMNS and uh, also on, on uh, Jed Rothwell's library. And you know, they it would fog film. The radio they had electrodes that they would produce that would fog film, but when they tried to detect the radiation with their instrumentation, which they thought was an order of magnitude at least more sensitive than what it would take to fog film. And they, they didn't see anything. And they did, those reports were very thorough. They did uh, experiments where they had various separators uh, you know, in between and, and it would stop, you know, it would prevent the film from being fogged. But and even without anything, they were unable to detect it. And 
and their concluding conclusion in the last paper they published said that they, you know, they, they concluded that an unknown agent must be involved in the radiation. And for an agency like Bark to have to admit, you know, cry uncle and say, well, it's an unknown agent. I think that that pretty well says it's a difficult thing. Now, the other thing is uh, another person who has replicated is Andrew Erickson, who's recently retired from Los Alamos. He has done multiple attempts to, to look for the ionizing radiation, including a cloud chamber. And at this point, he has not discovered anything, so, or has not detected any, anything except his check sources. He knows his systems are working because they, he, he can, you know, the check sources are detected, but from the cell, he doesn't see anything. Just one other question. This works equally in air, oxygen, nitrogen, argon, or hydrogen? Uh, actually, uh, no, it doesn't work equally. It's, uh, it works somewhat better in air, and we suspect that's because uh, oxygen is an electronegative gas. So that's, you know, optimiz optimizing the gas mixtures is, is something that we think will help us to scale up. If you think low-level uh, ionization is uh, going on in your gas, it would seem to me that an integrating uh, optical diagnostic might be the most sensitive to try to test for it. Yeah, we, there are lots of experiments we'd like to do. We did try and experiment uh, if, if, if recombination occurs, there would be photon, photons emitted. We put a photomultiplier tube in and we never, you know, we, we had it in a plastic uh, end cap and, and even when we painted the end cap black and, and put tape on it, it was still leaking enough, enough light that we couldn't detect uh, anything on the inside. So you're right, that's, that would be one thing that we could look at and that would also be uh, proof that we are, do have ionizing radiation and that recombination is occurring. One thing I didn't mention is, you know, we believe this is a f diffusion driven device uh, rather and, and Harper Whitehouse has a poster that describes this. Uh, we have only found three papers where people really focus on diffusion. One by Rike in 1903, one by a book by K.K. Darrow in 1932, and a, a paper by Tate in 1956 or 1965. Um, Darrow you know, and Enrique both say it's a fourth order nonlinear difference equation. Darrow draws the conclusion that when you have these, this effect, you will, you can diffusion will produce a voltage and current. So he actually concludes what we're seeing. Tate, there's no analytical solution that, for the fourth order nonlinear difference equation, but Tate uh, numerically analyzed it and got some answers. However, some of the parameters he put in are different from what we, he, what we see in our experiments. And so, so some of the results uh, are, don't, don't apply directly. Yeah. Okay. So um, maybe uh, we have done indirectly for over 22 years an experiment using our wire and counter electrode. And uh, we call the voltage when we disconnect the power open circuit voltage. And we have found correlation between this value and the HS heat before giving from the wire. Uh, you don't have any kind of explanation, and, uh, uh, but this effect decrease, decreasing the temperature and increase when we decrease the pressure of the chamber. So it seems a uh, conflicting uh, phenomena, so we never go deeper. Uh, maybe I will send you all uh, our data to try to yeah. understand. Great, we appreciate all the help, and I think I'm, at this point, uh, 
I'm beginning to cut into the next, you know, the poster session. I don't want to do that. We have a display table in the poster area. And so with your permission, I would like to get off the stage and, and uh, give the control back to the organizing committee. So thank you.